Welcome to Trithi Amatra. Uh, Bangladesh has struggled uh, with issues of systematic uh, corruption and lack of good governance uh, for a very long time. Uh, Bangladesh ranks 168 out of uh, 190 uh, countries in the World Bank Doing Business 2020 report. Now, with increasingly volatile global uh, supply chains, fears of impending global recession, uh, rising external debts, and uh, falling foreign reserves, uh, the immediate future of Bangladesh's economy uh, can be called into a question. Uh, joining us today to discuss the economy, governance, and democratic space in Bangladesh, uh, to my left, Dr. Asif Shahan, uh, Associate Professor of Development Studies at the Dhaka University. Uh, next to him, uh, Mr. John Morrill, Regional Director for the Asia and the Pacific uh, at the Center for International Private Enterprise SIPE headquarters uh, in uh, Washington, uh, D.C., USA. And next to him, uh, Mr. Nul Kobir, Editor, New Age. Uh, welcome to Trekia uh, Let me start with this. Uh, what is uh, meant by good governance and what are the uh, pitfalls nations face uh, if good governance is not maintained? Mr. Nul Kobir. Oh, thank you. In the first place, uh, to be polite, uh, that I really don't understand good governance. Okay. What I understand is democratic governance, mm -hmm. the basis of which is elections. A government is supposed to be elected by the people. The government has to have the accountability. Has, a government has to have the transpar transparent Trans transactions of business, so legal, political, and financial. If you go by those definitions, I must say, with a lot of shame, of course, that my country is not a democracy, and in a democ without democracy, a country cannot have uh, what you call good governance. Uh, you see, the direct product of an authoritarian government a government that doesn't have any accountability to the people it is financial corruption. Authoritarianism and financial corruption is directly related to each other. And usually we have seen in this part of the world and some part of the what we call third world countries that the financial corruption has been taking place usually in the name of developments. And when we talk about development, and depends on how we uh, define it. For example, only in June this year, mm -hmm. our Prime Minister has publicly said that she wonders as to why some people like us cannot see the lot of developments that has taken place in this country. We used to say that of course there are developments taking place, but what is the objectives of this development? Is it uh, real development for me? Is development of the human resources? Development, I mean, removing of hunger, development of education, development of skills, development of uh, in many other human qualities. And of course, that has to be taken place based on equality. Mm -hmm. so now, before I point out to the level of inequalities that uh, we have been exposed to, let me rather put forward the funny question. Six months ago when a Prime Minister says that she wonders why people cannot see the development she has ensured, mm -hmm. and even suggested that those who cannot see or the blind of the development, she even suggested to give, uh, what is it called, that the vaccination of the eyes with using, by using the uh, syringe. Mm -hmm. Now, in a few months, the same Prime Minister is suggesting that there is an imminent famine. She's, she's telling that we may not have electricity even uh, at, at night. Her, her uh, advisor on energy is suggesting, again, once again, mm -hmm. that we have to learn to save electricity at the daytime. So what kind of a development uh, this, the incumbents 
have been talking about for years. Rather, what kind of things uh, have that taken place? I can give very, very, uh, very brief uh, statistics produced by even the government and the internationally recognized uh, organizations across the world. Say, uh, our commerce, commerce minister, on, on, only in the first week of June, he said, even in, in a parliament, made a public statement telling that he doesn't, doesn't say that all the 16 core people of this country uh, has, be, has become rich or the, uh, they, they, they have lost, uh, they have adequate buying mm -hmm. capacity. Mm -hmm. But he says, three crore are still below the poverty line. And, but at the same time, spending power of four to five crore people uh, uh, has reached that of the Westerners or the, uh, and the Europeans. In the first place, the whole model mm -hmm. of development mm -hmm. that four to five crores of people have attained the, uh, attained the purchasing capacity of the middle class people in the West, uh, particularly in Europe, and at the same time he's telling people without uh, without uh, uh, shame, mm -hmm. that three core people still lives below the poverty line, mm -hmm. and how these four to five core people gain that, if it is at all true, mm -hmm. gain that capacity? That's very simple, mm -hmm. because inequal uh, in, in, approach of inequality. In, in the de de development paradigm. Say, what is the real picture? He is talking about the below the poverty line and the, what kind of poverty that they are in. Only in July 7 mm -hmm. this year, the state of food security and nutrition in the world, that, that's a uh, uh, credible uh, research organization across the world, says 73.5% of Bangladeshis are un unable to afford healthy food as one needs to spend $3.64 for getting required nutrition per day, mm. while Bangladesh remains the third most vulnerable mm. after Nepal and Pakistan. And if you talk about the development projects, mm -hmm. I said there is no accountability, political accountability, and in the name of developments, there are corruptions. Mm -hmm. Just as, let me give you a simple, simple example. Government has given as much as Taka 90,000 crore as capacity charge without getting a watt of electricity to the private sector rental power plants between 2011 and 2012 financial year. Of that amount, a total of 60,000 crore went to the pockets of only 12 companies. So anyone having a little common sense can mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. where does the money go in the name of uh, development and why some people have attained the capacity, uh, purchasing capacity of uh, living a life of middle class people in the in Europe, and why 3.7% uh, uh, crore people even cannot, uh, sorry, 73% mm -hmm. of the people cannot ha have even a compromised diet. At the same time, you are spending so much of money right. for uh, uh, electricity production. And you are telling me that uh, we may have to uh, uh, stop using uh, electricity, electricity in, in daylight. In, 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 uh, at the daylight. Mm -hmm. So these are the big. So why it has been possible for them to continue? This once again political politics and governance yeah. comes because they have not allowed, or they have been successfully uh, uh, successful to oppress opposition. Mm -hmm. dissenting views. So uh -huh. if there is no check and balance, mm -hmm. if there is no resistance from the so societal level, at the societal level, you will be able to uh, run an authoritarian regime, indulge in corruption and make the people suffer. John, uh, what's your take on my first question? Well, simply put, good governance there are a lot of different, there's an, there are expansive definitions, there are minimalist definitions. Simply put, good governance means that the government is responsive, it's effective, and it's accountable. Um, and one of the pitfalls 
when nations lack well-functioning, properly functioning public institutions, one of the pitfalls is economic. There's overwhelming literature, the, the literature is overwhelming of the linkage between well-functioning public institutions and economic development. In the absence of well-functioning public institutions, in the absence of good governance, growth is possible, rapid growth is possible, but rapid reversals tend to be quite common as well. Look at Latin America. Economies large and small are, are experiencing this and they've experienced it for quite some time. Uh, so in the absence of good governance, in the absence of properly functioning public institutions, sustained and inclusive economic development is almost impossible to achieve. And an example of this, uh, look at Hong Kong mm -hmm. today, right mm -hmm. now. Hong Kong passed, or I should say, Hong Kong had imposed on it by Beijing mm -hmm. something called the National Security Law, which basically makes the Hong Kong legal system simply an extension of the PRC. Uh, and the data is becoming increasingly clear that Hong Kong is becoming a less attractive destination for foreign direct investment as a result. Uh, Dr. Asif Shahan, uh, in your opinion, what is the state of governance in Bangladesh? Well, I think. I think we have started uh, that discussion. I mean, when we're talking about, uh, you know, governance, just to, just to sort of go back a little bit that uh, when we're talking about the state of governance, and it's, it's important to understand that, you know, again, uh, going back to your first question, mm -hmm. that how we are defining governance mm -hmm. from this perspective. Uh, the problem with the term governance is it is everywhere. You can use this word to anything. You can use this word with nutrition. You can say that word nutrition governance. You can use it with environment, and you can say environment governance. That's that's the problem with the with the you know when we're expanding the term uh, mm -hmm. to a large extent. But roughly speaking, there are three different ways we can talk about uh, you know governance. And the, at the economic uh, sector, when we are talking about uh, regulatory quality, regulatory control, and those kind of things, which are actually sort of producing growth or affecting growth, that's one aspect of governance we are talking about. Uh, on the administration side, when we talk about collaboration and collaborative way of working, that's one aspect of government. But I think the focus of our today's discussion is from mostly on the political perspective, that when we talk about governance uh, and what Mr. Kobir has talked about, the democratic governance. There are two things here. First of all, when we are talking about democratic governance, what it essentially means is that there must be an agreement among the political parties or political elites within a country about, a political set settlement. Yeah, about, well, we you can, can talk say, about yeah. political settlement or we can talk about an equilibrium that has mm -hmm. been uh, established about the functions, roles and functions of the institutions. There must be commitment that the, the political parties are actually trying to build those institutions like parliament, like judiciary, like in different institutions of accountability like anti-corruption commission, human rights commission, information commission. You are allowing those institutions a certain level of independence and autonomy so that they can actually check the power of the executive. Mm -hmm. That sort of agreement has to be there. And also there has to be an agreement that well, there will be regular alternation of power, that you will have election which will allow people to have their voices. And at the same time, at the deeper level, there has to be some sort of respect and understanding about the democratic norms and values among the parties because without that norms and values, it is not necessarily be able to come to an agreement about the uh, you know, political system. So if we consider it from that perspective, from that democratic governance perspective, then we have to say the state of governance is not necessarily looking that well. To some extent, we have some problem with the overall democratic governance from, you know, from the transition to democracy in 1991 in terms of our respect for democratic norms and values. And at the same time, over the last uh, you know, uh, 18 years, mm -hmm. uh, up to 2008, there was not necessarily an agreement among the political parties that how can we rebuild or build the uh, you know, democratic institutions. We have not necessarily tried to strengthen the parliament. We have not necessarily tried to uh, strengthen the anti-corruption commission and others which has created the trouble that we are facing today. The reason I'm saying that, we only have one thing at, at that stage. That was that we were having election after every five years, which is allowing an alternation of power. When that particular aspect is taking away from us in 2014, and which essentially means that the government is actually transforming from an electoral democracy to an electoral authoritarianism. Mm -hmm. So that transformation is all when it is happening, so we are now in a situation we don't necessarily have any any mechanism available
to uh, you know let the people have their voice uh, the responsiveness is gone and at the same time we are working within a political environment where the political institutions are not necessarily strong to you know check the uh, uh, executive which is what mr kobir is saying that is allowing the corruption to grow and since we are talking about measuring governance, mm -hmm. World Bank has actually used since 1998 six indicators to measure uh, you know, good governance. When we talk about those indicators, there is political stability and uh, violence is there, voice and accountability is there, regulatory quality uh, is there, control and corruption uh, um, is there, government effectiveness is there. Now, if you just look into Bangladesh's score, Mm -hmm. Within these indicators, it mm -hmm. is very clear that in all of those six indicators, except for probably one, the country's governance is deteriorating. It has been deteriorating since 1998, that's a given, but after 2008 and 2009, and more specifically after 2014, those score has significantly declined. Mm -hmm. In terms of voice and accountability, we are not necessarily where we were in 1998. In terms of control and corruption, we are not there. And to be very honest, if you look into the different uh, agencies or organizations mm -hmm. that evaluate Bangladesh, no one of them actually right now considering Bangladesh are democratically governance uh, countries. Vulnerable, uh, VDEM, the very varieties mm -hmm. of democracy, now considers Bangladesh an electoral authoritarianism. It shows that authoritarian tendency is going on. Polity 4 is no longer considers Bangladesh as an anocracy. It has become an autocracy according to them. Freedom House is no longer considering Bangladesh a free country. So that particular assessment by international organizations is there. What is, to, what is doing here? When, it, when the framework of the governing system changes, the democratic governance decline and you have an authoritarian government, the authoritarian government needs to maintain a winning coalition, a coalition member. Mm -hmm. It's it's uh, you know it's it's loyalist, and those loyalists are not necessarily party loyalists or ideological mm -hmm. loyalists. Those loyalist support you need to buy, and in order to buy the support, you need to engage in corruption because you need to mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, divert resources to them, and that is why the whole economic system become unsustainable because you know as long as because you can survive as long as you can uh, you know continue corruption when that stops the whole system collapses and that is the current danger probably we are facing okay. uh, mr john Moll, is there any uh, correlation between uh, healthy democracy and good governance oh yes as my good friend was was just saying there's it is a real thing for a country to be an electoral authoritarianism mm -hmm. because democracy is more than elections mm -hmm how a government governs in between elections oftentimes matters even more than the ability of citizens to, to cast a vote. And there's actual polling data from countries all over the world demonstrating this, that in the absence of sustained economic development, in the presence of rampant corruption, um, in the absence of real economic opportunity, support for democracy falls even when countries are still able to go to a ballot and you know, go to the ballot box and, and, and cast their vote. Because democracy is more than, than just elections. Uh, countries, again, all over the world, all over Asia, all, of the, all over the Middle East demonstrate this. Most countries in the world conduct elections. The, the number of countries that don't conduct elections at all, really you can count on your fingers now. Even countries that are nakedly authoritarian, nakedly, nak they are nakedly dictatorships. Um, they still conduct elections in some form or another. And so, like, as I was saying earlier, in the absence of good governance, in the absence of well-functioning institutions, uh, and it, it's, it's intuitive. If you put yourself in the, you know, all of us are citizens of our respective countries. I'm a foreigner, I'm a guest in Bangladesh. Um, but if my government, if my democratically elected government isn't delivering results for me, I don't have a good job. I don't have the prospect of a good job. I'm inundated with corruption. I can't renew my passport. I can't get power hooked up to my, to my home. I can't renew my business license without paying bribes left and right. Of what use is democracy? And so it's critical, therefore, for democracy to deliver. Democracy has to deliver results. It has to make an impact on people's lives. Um, because again, in the absence of it, of what use is democracy, the, the, the tangible result that, uh, that these democratic governments need to provide, again, is responsive, effective, and accountable governance. Uh, 
Government actions need to be transparent. Decision making is participatory and quality public services are provided. When democratically elected governments deliver in that way, support for democracy rises. Uh, Mr. Nurul Kabir, uh, Bangladesh's uh, current state of democracy uh, can be described, as you mentioned earlier, as a dominant executive uh, wing operating with a limitless power, uh, combined with inefficient and inept uh, judicial and legislative wings that are not allowed to operate independently. Uh, in such a scenario, is it even possible to ensure inclusive uh, uh, good governance, uh, according to your just governance, and uh, representative of the people's will? Uh, or do more fundamental problems uh, of democracy need to be addressed uh, before we can fix issues of governance? Thank you. Uh, this is the most important point that you have asked. And the whole, I mean, thinking sections of this of the people uh, needs to ponder over this uh, it's quite a very important, nationally important question. Number one, now, uh, without uh, democracy, we cannot uh, solve these problems. But the question is, how to do away with the uh, autocratic system, autocratic governance inherent in the constitutional process? For example, Bangladesh constitution allows one single person to become the prime minister, meaning the chief of the executive wing of the state, becomes to head the legislature, the parliament. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the chief of the uh, ruling party. Now, if, if a, const a constitution of the state allows a person to concentrate all these powers in one hand, no matter he or she is an angel or not, one has to be uh, behaving like an autocrat. So, question is, the fundamental question is, we have to have genuine constitutional reforms. For example, that whether, a whether judiciary can function under such a system. If one person can control the executive and, and the legislature and the ruling party, the whole scenario is intimidating for other branches of the state. Mm -hmm. And they can easily control, even not uh, in saying anything in so many words. I mean, the judiciary uh, and, uh, and, you know, that we have an additional problem that we have always, or for, for uh, decades together, the appointment of judges are being done on uh, considering the partisan loyalty of the past. Okay. Now, given the uh, present situations, many people are saying that, well, uh, the number uh, and the incumbents uh, days are numbered. Mm -hmm. Even if these incumbents go and another set takes, another set comes in, we cannot resolve our problem until and unless we do have some genuine constitutional reforms, administrative reforms, and legal reforms. For mm -hmm. so that's the most challenging issue in front of us today. Uh, I mean, say the kind of. Mm, Media regime that we have, for example, side by side with the mm -hmm. uh, judiciary. If you do not have a media regime under which people can duly express their dissent or people can really put forward their uh, different views of developments and uh, with an authority and government in power, you cannot just proceed. A nation cannot uh, grow. For example, the kind of policies that uh, the government has been pursuing for, for the three terms. Despite all odds, some people in this country have, stuck, have criticized and put forward alternative views that this should be the uh, development model and this should not be the development model. But an authoritarian government hardly hits to the uh, views of the opponents. Yep. But so, and, and here comes the question of Accountability. We have to force the electorate. The electorate have, has to force the uh, elected people to listen to the people and follow. And at least, I mean, we are not talking about socialism or something. We are talking about uh, about uh, uh, about the birth promises mm -hmm. that Bangladesh has 50 years ago. That we have to have a 
a society of equality, of justice, mm -hmm. of uh, uh, dignity of the people. But this way uh, we have been, uh, the state has been run. We, we are drifting away every day from that bad promises. So the fundamental issue today is what is going to happen, even uh, this authoritarian regime goes and with all these laws and systems and traditions, mm -hmm. say another set of people comes in. So this is time for the civil society to think about that. Uh, Dr. Asif Shahan, what are the main challenges uh, that uh, Bangladesh is facing currently regarding the uh, governance? Well, I mean, there are, uh, again, I think, I think a part of that has already come from our discussion, that mm -hmm. when we're talking about Bangladesh, it's, it's, it's about the, the regime type, the, the authoritarianism, the competitive authoritarian system that we're talking about. It has essentially become the major challenge. Two things here. I mean, one of the things that, you know, since uh, Mr. Kubler was talking about the checks and balance and power sharing, I just, I, I just want to, you know, paraphrase Madison here. Uh, Madison in Federalist and made a very interesting statement that if human beings are angels, we probably would not need any government. If government were, uh, if uh, you know, if government were made of angels, we probably would not have need any check and balance or power sharing mm -hmm. system. But this is the thing: neither human beings are angels, nor the government is actually made of angels. Mm -hmm. So we need that power sharing, and this is where democracy works better. Where this is where you can actually build the institutions that can create those check and balances that can, uh, uh, you know, ensure that power sharing is there. And this is the basic problem or basic limitation of authoritarianism. Now, it's important to understand that, uh, you know, in throughout the world, the way that authoritarianism is actually flourishing is actually, it's, it's, an, it's, it's something new. New in the sense is, in the past we have seen the authoritarian governments have come to, through armed forces. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there were, you know, a coup or something like that and that has, but today's world, in most of the countries is where this authoritarianism is taking place, it is happening through democratically elected government. The government that you know once came into power, uh, you know, elected by people and decided to sort of do something. It has happened in Turkey. It has happened um, happened in Bangladesh, and uh, it has happened in Hungary and a lot mm -hmm. of other countries. This is how things are things are happening, and this is the thing. And the thing is, when this happens, these governments have what the uh, you know several scholars have pointed out. Uh, you know, they use a certain strategy. At one point, the first strategy is they try to weaken the institution or the rules of the game that we are talking about. This is where judiciary gets attacked, the press and free media gets, gets attacked, the institutions. Are, uh, not only are they actually getting attacked, these institutions are becoming weapons of the government to punish the opposition. So it's just not only simply that you are taking a control of the, let's say, law enforcement agencies, you are using those agencies to punish the opposition. So that's kind of something that is happening. The second thing they do, they significantly weaken, uh, and what we say, they shrink the civic space. The political space available for the civil society organizations, the political space available for the uh, uh, NGOs and others who actually try to promote democracy, that is, uh, you know, evaporated. And mm -hmm. if you look into Bangladesh, we have uh, the Foreign Donation Control Act in 2016. We have Digital Security Act in 2018. We have a different means to make sure that, well, there is some kind of a strategic and silencing. Three more laws are coming. Yeah, three more mm -hmm. laws, are, laws are coming. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the interesting thing is you are actually doing it by book. Uh, you are, have a parliament, you are having laws, you are, you are doing that, uh, and this is how uh, the government works and this is what this is what the problem is the third thing then they do is basically they coerce and this coercion is something that is important because that actually uh, do that so this authoritarian system its continuation which mm -hmm. is creating a problem in the voice and accountability uh, thing which is essentially affecting responsiveness because mm -hmm. Because if you are not necessarily accountable to the people, you don't have any incentive to listen to what people are uh, requiring. So your focus is somewhere else. You are doing uh, something else. And this is where you know we hear about kleptocracy. We hear about capital flight. We hear about sort of you know taking cash to other countries. Those kind of things. Things are happening, and that's part of part of that process. So this regime system is continuous, and within these rules, 
then well yes this is this is the biggest challenge that we see john uh, ideally it is in the states the best uh, interest to tackle corruption uh, in the economy but if the rulers uh, of a hypothetical state uh, were alleged to be directly uh, involved in corruption uh, for purely self gain how can any progress be made as my my good friend was just saying you know the rule of law mm -hmm. means that a government assumes power based on law. Uh, they win an election based on law. They assume office based on law. They are bound by the law as they govern. Um, but as is sadly increasingly common, um, you mentioned Hungary, Bangladesh, but it's also Venezuela, Africa. Cambodia. Mm -hmm. the, the, the list unfortunately is very, very long mm -hmm. of countries, governments that don't exercise rule of law, it's rule by law where the law isn't the basis of the government's legitimacy. Mm -hmm. The law is a tool that the government uses to maintain and sustain its own power. And on the issue of when a government is corrupt, um, how can progress really be realistic in the fight against corruption? You know that old expression, trust but verify? Mm -hmm. Well, skip the trust, just, just verify. verify. It's so one of the most critical roles that the business community, that civil society, that media, opposition, political parties can play. Um, because many governments, maybe even most governments around the world, haven't really earned the trust of their people. Uh, and so it's necessary to verify how the government is spending money. Is the government spending money in ways that it said it would spend money? Uh, is the government spending money in ways that enrich themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, there's a view, especially in emerging markets. You know what? The, the, you know, you, you, you hear people say it. Well, that's the government's money, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so some of it went missing, their shenanigans with, with the budget, but you know what? That's the government's money. But one of the principles of a democracy is that the government's money is your money. You pay taxes, and therefore you should expect a return on those taxes. Mm -hmm. In countries I mentioned earlier, China, I'm not saying this to cast aspersions, it's simply a statement of fact. China, Burma, Venezuela, Cuba, Zimbabwe, the, unfortunately, Russia, the, the list is long. Um, these, these, gov the, these, the, the anti-corruption efforts in these countries too often focus exclusively on, on the government, either complaining about the government or asking the government to do something about it. Uh, whereas the most exciting work in the field of anti-corruption is focused on the private sector. Because in any, in the paying of a bribe, any corrupt transaction, just like any other transaction, there is a demand side, the side that's accepting the bribe, that's demanding the bribe. But there's also the side that's paying the bribe, that is supplying the bribe. Exciting work is being done with companies to work with companies to create uh, uh, sound corporate governance structures, mm -hmm. internal corporate uh, compliance structures that simply make it more difficult for employees, for vendors, for directors to engage in bribery and get away with it. Because ultimately, corruption is the result of a cost-benefit analysis like any other human mm -hmm. behavior, whether or not to engage in bribery, whether or not to demand a bri bribe or pay a bribe. And this is thoroughly documented empirically. If the expected return on bribery is, is high and the odds of getting caught are low, you're much more likely to, to see that happen. Whereas if the expected return is low and the odds of getting caught are high, it's much, more, it's much less likely uh, that, that corruption will take place. And ultimately, why this is so important for a, country, a, a, a large emerging market like Bangladesh, you know, and with all of the supply chain disruptions around the world, the world is becoming a more competitive place. There are more and more opportunities in supply chains, in global supply chains, for countries like Bangladesh that weren't viable options before because all the opportunities went to China. If a country like Bangladesh can change its its international reputation, its brand. You know, the brand of Bangladesh right now is one where the economy is doing well. 
I mean, after all, Bangladesh now has a higher GDP per capita than either India or Pakistan. But the brand, again, the international brand of Bangladesh is also one where the country is moving in the wrong direction in terms of democracy and human rights. This makes it harder for Bangladesh to compete and win in the global marketplace. The upcoming election is a fantastic opportunity for Bangladesh to reintroduce its democracy to the world, which would help Bangladesh, again, compete and win in an increasingly competitive global marketplace. Uh, uh, Mr. Nulkir, what role can uh, the media, civil society organization and the private sector play in ensuring good governance in uh, our nation? Uh, well, the picture is very clear. I would uh, just humbly disagree with uh, two points made here by my other colleagues. One is, as uh, Mr. Sahab said, uh, while That's giving it. examples of how uh, across the world or some part of the world, authoritarianism is produced through elections. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh, even this regime, was not a, pro a properly elected uh, regime. Mm -hmm. So they're, 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 talk they're, they're, they're uh, calling it or claiming it to win elections, mm -hmm. um, uh, I mean the uh, uh, ruling parties. But as we have seen in the 19, uh, two, uh, two, uh, 2014 and 2018, there was no election uh, as such. Second is that the uh, br Bangladesh brand that as uh, so my friend has said, that the economy is doing well. Uh, I should uh, give to you the, the message that no, Bangladesh is not doing well uh, even in the uh, in economy because for many of us, just growth of GDP uh, is not development, it's not economy. Because uh, even later on that the figure, GDP figure is contested here by our sound private mm -hmm. sector economies that the figure that government provides us with uh, is not correct. Even if we take, accept that the GDP is uh, growth rate is good, but the, the kind of growth that helps concentrate most of money in a few hands and rest of the people uh, have very uh, little to gain from the growth of the national economy, this is not sustainable. We have seen uh, so many cases, the recent scene in Sri Lanka. So, hmm. as you say, as you say, that what should the politically thinking or independent thinking people should do mm -hmm. to take this country out of the danger that it has been exposed to, thanks to the uh, thanks to the ruling class, which is in fact is a lumpen class. They don't, they neither uh, adhere to the concept of democracy nor any egalitarian economic values. They just understand authoritarianism, plundering of I mean, uh, money, and uh, plundering of public money, and then uh, laundering them in, the, uh, in distant places. To combat them, we have to have a clear picture that without a coalition of authoritarian politicians, uh, sections of the unscrupulous business and uh, unscrupulous sections of bureaucracy without the uh, chain at a, as, is a simple complex mm -hmm. chain simple as well as, as well as complex we needs to be broken for the sake of the millions of people and we really really have to work hard taking as much as a race comes for the sake of the future of this country, work hard to tell people that the country belongs to the people, not that, not to the a small group of people mm -hmm. who plunders public money, <clears throat> doesn't speak, listen to the people and takes the money somewhere else. Another regime comes, spends some months abroad have un underground negotiations with the new incumbents, mm -hmm. come back, and the cycle continues. Mm -hmm. We have to challenge that. We have to expose <laughs> them. Mm -hmm. And we have to talk about real, real democracy that needs to be taken root in this country. Indeed, indeed. Uh, uh, Dr. Asif Shah, are there any models or uh, methods of uh, reducing corruption uh, that has worked in other nations and uh, economies abroad? And can those models or methods be used in Bangladesh? Okay. 
uh, just 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 before answering that question, I, I just need to clarify something. I mean, uh, I mean, going back to that uh, uh, point, that when I was talking about you know the uh, electoral regime, I was not necessarily referring to 2014 or 2018 election because there's no doubt about what happened in 2014 or 2018. What I was referring to was in 2008. I mean, this is because that election was you know considerably fair, and I mentioned that you know like a lot of other countries of the world. This is how authoritarianism sort of, you know, uh, propelled in Bangladesh and mm -hmm. the starting point in 2008 and then 2014, the regime completely changed. Now, this is basically the question that you asked us. It's a very difficult question. The first thing is, I mean, let me, let me just put it this way. So there are two ways to answer, uh, answer this mm -hmm. question. One is, uh, to some extent, from a normative perspective, that mm -hmm. what we want, what should be done, how we want different actors uh, to behave. So you can design a model, you can design a framework, you can design institutions and expect everyone to work this way. Unfortunately, in real life, it doesn't work that way. And to be very honest, in 2004, 5 and 6, there was a critical discussion that was going on that what we're seeing that in a lot of countries, even though the rate of corruption was high, but, but the economic growth uh, was really high. So the, the understanding that we had that corruption was essentially reduced economic growth, that did not happen. So mm -hmm. that, that actually sort of encouraged a lot of uh, you know, scholars to question that what is really happening. Does corruption uh, is actually a problem or corruption is a part of govern, you know, development process, economic growth process that has happened. Over the years, different countries have tried to apply different models. Singapore has their uh, own models to sort of an authoritarian uh, you know, system. They have tried to do that. But all of those models, all of those things have their limitations. It has not necessarily worked perfectly well in any countries. But what we have understood, what we have known from different experiments, that there are some common things. We cannot eliminate corruption completely. That will remain part of the thing. But what we can do, two things. Mm -hmm. We can reduce that. Uh, and we can reduce the impact of corruption on the citizens. Now, then now let's ask the question that how can we do that? Again, one way is uh, theoretically you build those institutional mechanisms. You build horizontal accountability mechanisms where uh, there are institutions which will try to uh, ensure accountability of the government agencies and others so that public money is not necessarily being used for private gains. You support those, those horizontal accountability mechanisms with electoral accountability mechanism or vertical accountability, accountability mechanism, where the government is responsible for its action. And if they fail, people will have right to mm -hmm. sort of throw them mm -hmm. out of the government. Uh, a new government will come, and that will try to deliver services. So these two things, the horizontal and uh, uh, vertical accountability mechanism, when these two works, that is one possibility. In addition to that, in, uh, in the early 2000s, we allowed another particular understanding, what we call the social accountability. That, But the idea is you empower people, you make them aware, you let them know that what is going on, what services they deserve, what services they're supposed to get from the government. And if they don't necessarily get those services, where they can go, where they can reach, what they can do, the grievance reader system and others. Again, these are all theoretical discussions that this is something uh, you know, that can work if we can sort of you know, ensure a marriage between horizontal, vertical, and social mm -hmm. accountability mechanism. But it will depend from country to country, country's context to country's context, how powerful the political parties are, how, what the governing system is, what the elites are doing. So this is a, this is a different, different question. So we cannot come up with a, mm -hmm. with a comment, but we can uh, actually argue that the democratic system is probably will do better in terms of uh, you know, controlling corruption. John, is there a need for a root level educational uh, reform to uh, accustom uh, people and the popular culture uh, to matters of ethics, uh, legal compliance, uh, and good governance? There's not a need for education in terms of teaching people that corruption is morally wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's basically universally accepted. In pretty much every country around the world, corruption is illegal. Bribery is a crime. And so there, it's not really a matter of teaching people that corruption is bad, but rather that corruption isn't inevitable is what I think people need to know. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting research out of the University of Stockholm mm -hmm. talking about social norms. 
Uh, and there are two different kinds of social norms. There's a, the norm of whether or not something is right or wrong. And those are relatively fixed over the course of your life. I mean, think about it. How many, from your own perspective, how many things in, over the course of your life did you used to think were morally wrong, but now you think they're okay? Those, those sorts of norms are rather fixed over the course of people's lives. Is it right or wrong? The other type of norm is, is it common? And that view can change. And what the, the research out of the University of Stockholm has shown is, if someone believes that uh, an illicit behavior is unavoidable, everyone does it. You can't do business in country X unless you play the game, that there's just no way to avoid it. Someone is more likely by a factor of four to engage in that behavior. Whereas if people think that, yes, it's bad, but it's not inevitable, it is avoidable. There's a way of doing business without engaging in that. There's a way of living your life without engaging in that. You are far less likely by a factor of four to engage in that behavior. Uh, and so ultimately the moral of that story is unless people believe that progress is possible, progress won't be made. If people believe it's sort of a hopelessness, if people believe, again, it's corruption, it's unavoidable, it's inevitable, you can't avoid it, you can't do business without doing it. Uh, progress ultimately will always remain ethereal and, and will never really be realized. Uh, Mr. Nul Kobir, uh, the current and upcoming uh, legislature in Bangladesh <laughs> seems uh, uh, to be targeted to close uh, the space for both the civil society and political uh, opposition. Uh, what steps need to be taken in order to uh, open up a space uh, for political participation and keep the uh, space open in the future? Resistance. Uh, very shortly. Resistance, people's resistance, or politically conscious, organized resistance is the only answer mm -hmm. across the world, ac across the ages, uh, to fight against authoritarianism, political uh, corruption, economic mm -hmm. corruption, it's only the people. And uh, there's no uh, sh short path for that. There's no, uh, one has to work up, uh, uh, sections of the people, conscientious people, democratically mm -hmm. oriented people, has to work hard days after days, sometimes years after years. There's no short, so, short that's cut, the only solution. shortcut for that. Mm -hmm. And just to refer to the previous discussions, just a small uh, intervention that I would like to make is, yes, in the 1970s and in the 80s, we have seen some theories that even in some societies, particularly in the third world country, country countries, if corruption accelerates uh, growth. Mm -hmm. But we have noticed in those days that these theories have, those days, it came from the Western experts that they never uh, support these factors to grow in their own countries. That's one that we have realized in this part of the world. Mm -hmm. And second is that, that the electoral autocracy we are talking about is a funny thing for me though. Mm -hmm. I wrote, wrote a book called Noirbatonic Shwerotantra, meaning mm -hmm. the, the title of the book was Electoral Autocracy mm -hmm. before many, many years ago. <laughs> The tragedy is, we, we have reduced to less than that. And you see, it's a tragedy for a country that, that uh, fought out an independent country for democracy, equality and justice. We are now demanding voting rights, restoration of voting rights, an 18th century demand in 2022. 20, mm -hmm. That's sad. Sad for us. Shameful for the rulers. We wish they develop some sense of dignity, some sense of integrity, and uh, forgive for the people. <laughs> so, uh, this is final round, and uh, I have three questions, and I'm putting these three questions together. Uh, first of all, we saw recently the World Bank cutting Bangladesh's GDP uh, growth forecast. Mm -hmm. And uh, has the momentum of growth for Bangladesh's economy uh, been stifled? Uh, what can Bangladesh do now to uh, continue uh, growing? My second question is, what effect has the global recession 
So following Russia's invasion in Ukraine had on the economy and governance in uh, Bangladesh and uh, considering the information you were aware of, what is your expectation regarding Bangladesh's uh, democracy leading up to the upcoming national elections? Is your, each of you have only one minute. Uh, Dr. Asif Shahan, oh. please. Okay, uh, difficult to talk about uh, all of those in one yeah, minute. Yeah. So, uh, you you uh, can choose any question okay. or... Let, uh, let me just talk about, uh, you know, uh, the impact of global recession on this thing. I mean, I think we all can agree that yes, there probably are some impacts. I mean, yeah, the way that, you know, those countries have produced goods and everything, and the way there mm -hmm. is an impact on supply chain, we cannot deny that. But I think the more critical question is, is not necessarily only the recession, yes, it has uh, created an impact, but at the same time, what what we are talking about at the very beginning that just a few months ago we are talking about becoming Singapore we are talking about you know having everything we are talking about uh, being a developed country by 2041 where there will be no poverty then if that is really the case then the economy should have some shock resistant strategy the economy should have been resistant to these shocks and economy should have at least performed better than what we are observing that that has not happened and that actually raises the question to what extent, because we cannot say at this point that mm -hmm. to what extent the global recession is doing that to what extent other factors, but what we can say that the authoritarian model that is happening, the economic system that it has developed, the way that rents are being uh, produced to the companies and others, the, uh, the things mm -hmm. that are going, the corruption, that has actually played probably a bigger role in terms of this, uh, yeah, this issue. Well, on Bangladesh's upcoming election, uh, I'm a foreigner, I'm a guest here. Um, and I'm also not worth much as a political forecaster. So I can't say what my, I won't say what my expectation is, but I will say what my hope is. And my hope is that ultimately there's diverse voter participation. Uh, there's non-violent competition, both in the, during the election season and also after election day. And that the election is a competition of ideas. I, as opposed to a competition of personalities and a competition of threats. And I know that may sound sort of like a pie in the sky wish, but this, this election really is an opportunity for Bangladesh to reintroduce its democracy to the world, which as I said earlier, will help Bangladesh. We were talking about the, the global economy. That will help Bangladesh compete and win in an increasingly competitive global marketplace. Thank you, Mr. Nurkabit. Well, Number one, we need to notice that the incumbents are talking about the impact of global uh, global uh, uh, recession, particularly in the uh, in, in the context of Ukraine uh, Ukraine war. So we need to tell the people that yes, there are predictions by international authorities, competent authorities, that a global re uh, recession is coming. And some countries will may be exposed to even famine that the that the uh, that our prime minister mm -hmm. is suffering mm -hmm. too. But we clearly need to need to point out that the predictions are not for all the countries, forty five countries. Even not for all those countries who be who have the similar status mm -hmm. that mid, middle income countries. Mm -hmm. So that the Bangla that Bangladesh has been exposed to. The threat is because of authoritarianism, mm -hmm. corruption, and money laundering by the ruling class. This has become a, a so-called democracy of the plunderers, by the plunderers, for the plunderers. <laughs> we need to restore the idea at the, at the thought level and try to implement them that the democracy has to be of the people, by the people, and for the people, and that, that that whether an election will really take place on a scheduled time, I don't know, <coughs> because politics mm -hmm. is getting very complex. Mm -hmm. But only thing that we can do is to fought, fight for democracy. Thank you, Dr. Asif Shahan, uh, Mr. John Morrill, and Mr. Durkovir for being with us for time and thoughts. Thank you so much. Uh, the current uh, trends uh, facing Bangladesh's economy and uh, democratic uh, space all indicate uh, regression. Uh, the most important question uh, in the public uh, consciousness now is the uh, upcoming national elections, as uh, my guests uh, were talking about. All members of society uh, await with a bated breath uh, to see whether the promise of free and fair elections can be delivered. Uh, 
uh, for only through uh, the democratic process uh, uh, can the nation's economy be uh, swung in a direction that allows a prosperous uh, and equitable growth for all people of Bangladesh. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thanks for joining with us.